So good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, first of all, welcome to all of you, uh, those of you who are from outside to the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, if it's your first visit, this is one of our main buildings. Um, if you are a regular here, welcome again to this particular seminar. I'm delighted uh, on behalf of the Johns Hopkins International Injury Research Unit to welcome you all, and a particular welcome to all of the people who are watching this on the live stream. We have, um, I hope, uh, uh, a number of colleagues around the world indicated that they would like to at least listen to some of the fine talks that we are going to have. And so it's a huge opportunity for those of us who can't be physically with us to at least join us on the internet. So welcome to you all as well. It's a great pleasure for us to have these symposia. The primary goal of these symposia is really to um, have a discussion amongst ourselves on some of the important elements. And today we will talk about not only global road safety, but also how it links with the very important sustainable development goals. I'm also uh, excited that we have these opportunities to broadcast these events around the world because I feel that um, you know, in the olden days, we would only be able to have those who are in the room. And now it's a huge opportunity to engage with colleagues who can't be physically here, but who are part of our larger global community on road safety, as well as those who are interested, generally speaking, in development. And uh, I'm also excited that some of you are actually visiting us from different countries and have taken the time to be with us. So thank you very much for doing that. The Johns Hopkins International Injury Research Unit is now approaching nearly 10 years of its operation, and we are one of the many research centers in the Department of International Health. So I'd like to take a moment to thank not only the Bloomberg School of Public Health, but also our department for the support that they provide our research center. We are also a World Health Organization collaborating center, so we have very strong links and relationships with WHO. And I know that uh, many colleagues from WHO have engaged with us and participated with us, and we are grateful for their support as well. And very importantly, I'd like to acknowledge the support uh, and funding from Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, unfortunately, our colleague from Bloomberg Philanthropies, who was supposed to be here with us today, could not make it at the last minute. Uh, she sends her regrets. Uh, but we're very excited that at least uh, they are here in spirit and, of course, would warmly thank them uh, for the tremendous amount of support that Bloomberg Philanthropies provide, not just through their funding, but through their technical advice and through their orientation and engagement with multiple partners. I think that their support in global road safety has been quite instrumental in moving the field of global road safety uh, very much further along. So my role really was to first welcome you all to the symposium as well as to uh, the school and to Baltimore for those of you who are coming uh, from the outside. And secondly, to introduce our moderator for this symposium. I'm really honored and privileged that my dear friend and colleague, uh, Ms. Gail DiPietro, will be moderating this symposium. For those of you who don't know Gail, she comes uh, from Australia. Uh, her uh, background has years of experience in global road safety, both with academic institutions in Australia, like Deakin University and Monash University, with non-governmental organizations, as well as with the Global Road Safety Partnership most recently, where she was manager of the Bloomberg Initiative. In addition, Gail has tremendous experience traveling around the world, engaging with ministries of health and transport, with NGOs, with actually working on the ground. So unlike some people who are interested in theories only, Gail is interested in getting out there and making a difference. The other thing that I think is very relevant to today's symposium and why Gail is a tremendous resource for us is that she has worked across sectors. So she is not only uh, worked with the transport sector, but she's worked with police, she's worked with health, with infrastructure. And today we will see the diversity of those disciplines and sectors represented. So I'm delighted to welcome you, but I'm honored to welcome Gail, and I hand over the proceedings to her. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've just learned to navigate this. I can find my way around most airports. It's certainly just... Uh, uh, computers that uh, bother me for a moment. I'm just looking um, for the down. Yeah. Okay, let's go. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Hyder. It's been a pleasure to work with your team and to, um, hopefully to continue working with the team. Let me just say um, that we have a, a very various, uh, varied group here with us today, and we have four excellent speakers coming from four different countries on four different sectors. And we will all be working towards reducing death and injury on the world's roads. So we'll be hearing about their experiences and we'll be looking for opportunities to learn from each other and to um, share experiences. So I will introduce those four speakers as we go forward. In the area of road safety, we've been driven by um, um, major concepts and major frameworks for a number of years and it's been an organiser and a motivator for us to learn and to work towards uh, achieving the expected outcomes under the decade of action for road safety. It was uh, declared in 2011 and each year we've uh, looked at the challenges and the opportunities to save lives on uh, roads, particularly in low and middle income countries. Dr. Abdul Bachani will be talking to you more about the road safety, but a uh, decade of action for road safety. But I just wanted to talk about how there were five pillars of action, the road safety management, safer roads and mobility, safer vehicles, safer road users, and the post-crash response. And this helps us to better understand how um, many professions and how multi-sectoral and how many different uh, professions are required to work together and to collaborate to reduce death and injury on the road. Nobody owns road safety. It's across sectors and within sectors that we need to think about finding the solution and progressing um, the uh, saving of lives. The other, uh, other uh, initiative that uh, came very early uh, was the safe systems approach. And we, as we grew to understand road safety, we recognised that no one need die on the road. Everybody should be able to return safely to their home. And it's our understanding of the human tolerance of uh, a crash impact, so the kinetic energy, the forces on our body and what it does to us when we're hit by a vehicle, particularly at fast speeds. So we looked at having um, safer roads, safer speeds, safer vehicles and safer road users so that we can be sure that the system tolerates the errors that are made by people as they move in a complex transport system. Again, we'll learn more a little bit more about that. But in um, the Sustainable Development Goals, a recent uh, organiser or motivator for us, and it's a collection of 17 interrelated global goals set up by the United Nations. You can see that at the first glance, it doesn't look like they're interrelated. But if we look at the uh, third one, good health and well-being, we find ourselves with a goal that specifically relates to road safety. But we can't just look at one goal and say, we have to address that, or we have to address uh, goal 11, because there are clear uh, associations between road crash, road death and serious injuries with poverty and that's been recognised by the World Health, World Bank, FIA Foundation amongst many others. So we need to think about a holistic approach to these 17 goals with a particular um, focus on just the uh, two that we have uh, some mention of road safety or road transport or sustainable travel. I want to um, just point out to you first about the two the sustainable uh, development goals that we really have our own vision within. The goal three asks us to ensure healthy lives and to promote well-being for all at all ages. And we have some um, uh, targets within this goal, 
And so by 2020, we need to halve the number of global deaths and injuries from road traffic accidents. This is a very ambitious target, but it shouldn't stop us. It should motivate us to work even harder because the solutions for road death and road trauma, saving lives is already there. We just need to apply it and to think about getting political will and getting all of the um, pillars in place so that we can um, save lives. And we have to also look at the death rate due to traffic injuries, and Abdul will um, speak more about this. In goal 11, we need to think about making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And this is some tricky language for us who've been road safety purists. But we, this is where the sectors on sustainability, transport planning, um, urban um, design, all of the uh, different prof professions need to come together to be able to optimise the safety of those who are relocating or already existing in cities. So I would uh, like to say our four speakers that are coming today have um, experience across these sectors, particularly in the making the cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. And the rest of us, uh, uh, some of us are, are very deep into the promoting well-being and saving lives. So it's a great marriage that we're seeing here today. I would like to invite our four speakers to come to the stage before I introduce Dr. Bachani. So our first speaker will be, um, uh, sorry, our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Junto from um, Fortaleza. Sorry, it's hard with all these lives. I will do a more formal introduction as we go. I would like also to call um, Dr. Kung from Vietnam. Again, a formal invitation will come. Dr. Francis Akapa, F. Uka from Ghana, and Dr. Krishna Rao from India. I would now like to invite to the stage Dr. Abdul Bachani. Uh, he is certainly familiar to many of you. He's the Associate Director, uh, Deputy Director from um, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, the International Injury Research Unit. So, Abdul. Uh, thank you, Gail. So we'll just do this. I'm just doing okay. this. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. It's uh, really great um, to be here and to be talking about this issue. Um, and as Gail said, we're in this um, phase where we're within the decade of action for road safety. We have a framework, a new framework um, of the sustainable development goals to help guide us um, in terms of activities um, that we're doing to address this burden of injuries. Um, and road traffic injuries to be more specific. Um, however, before we even get into talking about the solutions, we need to understand what the problem is. So I thought I'd spend just a few minutes uh, before we um, invite our speakers to talk about the work that they do um, to see what the global burden is. Um, and needless to see, say that the problem is huge, which is why we're here, which is why we're talking about this, and which is why there's this global attention to it. Um, Road traffic injuries are really relevant to public health because of the multiple um, health issues and consequences associated with them. And we know that these consequences are both at the individual level and at the societal level as well. Um, so we have uh, consequences such as mortality and morbidity that we're all more familiar with, um, but also you know, because of that morbidity, there's this long-term and short-term disability um, for people who live with injuries and the econ economic and emotional costs to the society as well. Um, 
And um, I like to present this because it just shows us how this burden is distributed when we think about health outcomes due to road safety. While deaths are the most visible outcome and the most talked about outcome, um, even when we're looking at the sustainable development goals, we're talking about having um, deaths from road traffic injuries. Um, there, they're the smallest proportion of this burden. It's the lower three tiers of the pyramid that lead to the huge morbidity and disability burden um, of injuries that has a, a, a toll on um, the health of the public, the health of the society, as well as um, a huge economic burden. Here is how um, road traffic deaths compare to um, other health issues that we're more familiar with. Um, road traffic injuries um, estimates say that are responsible for about 1.3 million deaths each year. Um, that's equivalent to tuberculosis and more than malaria. Um, so you can see that while um, not you don't hear about road traffic deaths that often in, in line with these other health conditions, they're right up there in terms of their burden. So that equates to about 3,600 deaths each day happening from road traffic injuries. That's one death happening every 24 seconds. Every 24 seconds that we're in this room, one person is dying around the world because of a road traffic injury. And that's not it. We have 20 to 50 more people for each death that's happening who are injured. So we have about 20 to 50 million people each year who are seriously injured from road traffic injuries. And this just highlights the magnitude of the burden that we're dealing with and the need to be able to address it in a more effective and efficient manner. Um, these deaths are not equally distributed around the world. Um, you can see here from these graphs that while um, Low and middle income countries account for just about 54% of the world's registered vehicles. They bear 90% of this burden. So most of this burden falls in the low and middle, I mean, low resourced areas, the more vulnerable populations around the world. And this brings about the moral and ethical issue that we really need to act to be able to prevent these consequences from happening. Um, to, to, to these vulnerable populations. Here is the distribution of, um, again, we're just looking at death rates here. Um, keep in mind the, mor the morbidity burden as well. Death rates around the region um, as um, estimated by the World Health Organization. Um, and you can see here that the African region um, has the highest road traffic death rates followed by the Eastern Mediterranean region. And as we go to the more developed and the higher resourced areas of the world, this burden reduces, but it's still significant. Um, so not saying that those countries and those regions do not suffer from this uh, burden of road traffic injuries. And who amongst the road users is more affected? Um, what this graph is doing is separating out um, death rates by uh, different road users. And as you can see here, it's the more um, vulnerable users on the road. So your cyclists, your pedestrians, your users of motorcyclists that are more, most affected by this burden. And these are the green highlighted um, areas of this, of this pie. So as we're thinking about addressing the burden of road traffic injuries, it's important to look at not only the overall magnitude of the burden, but how it's distributed so we can target our, our um, solutions effectively. Um, so as I said, um, the economic cost is really high. Um, these are older estimates because um, economic estimates are usually harder to come by. Um, there are studies being done to get at more, um, much better estimates. But even then, um, you can see that the total global estimate is about $520 billion each year. Um, in terms of the cost due to road traffic um, injuries. So that's huge. That, that gives us an economic impetus to act as well. But we're not just operating in a vacuum. We know what works. We have solutions that work. We, we, we have um, things that we can rely on. We know, for example, that speed is among the most um, responsible for road traffic injuries. Um, one in three deaths um, on the road in high income countries, for example, is due to speed. Um, about 40 to 50% um, of the people on average drive above the speed limits. And speed is directly related to the risk of death. So for every increment in the kilometer per hour over the speed limit you're going, you're increasing um, the chances of being involved in a crash that will result in a death. 
We also know that motorcycle helmets work. Uh, motorcycle helmets have been found to be very effective. They reduce by 30% the chance of death um, from a crash as well as um, and even higher chance of reduction in brain injuries, which can lead to um, devastating um, disabilities and consequences. However, compliance in many low and middle income countries is still low for motorcycle helmets, and it's mostly the young riders and passengers um, that are unprotected. And we'll see from one, our one of our speakers that that there's ways and that there's programs and that there's legislation um, that you can implement to be able to improve um, use of motorcycle helmets. We also know that while we focus on prevention, we need to focus on the consequences of the crash once it happens. Um, we can't prevent all crashes from happening, so as an organized system uh, for addressing the burden of road traffic injuries, we need trauma systems in place as well. Um, and they would help uh, prevent deaths as well as disability um, across the entire spectrum. We know that many of these uh, solutions that we're talking about for road safety are cost effective. As compared to other um, public health interventions, this table shows that um, really we're buying it's, it's cheap to buy disability adjusted life years because of this inter intervention. So there's no reason not to implement them. There's uh, an economic burden to the society. There's an economic case uh, to be able to um, implement these interventions. Um, and also, I mean, when it comes to child injuries, here is another example. The child restraints, for example, for every dollar that you spend on child restraints, you're saving $29 for bicycle helmets, the same. Um, so for every investment that you're making, you're saving money, and the society is saving money as a result of that. So the, the, what we should ask ourselves is, why aren't we acting? Um, it's not like there's no uh, movement around this problem. <coughs> we, as Gail mentioned are in the uh, towards the tail end of uh, the global dec uh, the decade of action for road safety globally. Um, we have um, traction um, on the global arena as well with inclusion specifically in goals um, three and uh, eleven of the sustainable development goals, where we're talking about having um, the number of deaths by um, the year 2020. But. This is where we were supposed to be, based on those estimates that we just saw, based on the goals. We're in the year 2017, and we started the decade um, with 1.2 million deaths. We were supposed to be anywhere about 0.8, etc. And here is where we are. We're at 1.34 million. So instead of going in this right direction of a reduction in deaths, unfortunately, we've mainly um, probably increased slightly in terms of um, the, the mortality burden of road traffic injuries. So we should ask ourselves the question, why? It's not like we don't know what the solutions are. It's not like we don't know what the problem is. So what's, what's going wrong? Um, and one of the things that is happening is that implementation of road safety programs or implementation of what works and um, is, is lagging. We know that legislation is one of the pillars of a good program, of an effective program for road safety. It provides a framework for implementation of programs. And um, based on an analysis that the World Health Organization did for their global status report on road safety, we see that many countries don't have good legislation in place. For example, for comprehensive urban speed laws, only 47 countries around the world have good comprehensive urban speed laws on the books. Drink driving, similar problem. Only 34 countries have good drink driving laws. Uh, motorcycle helmets, similar issue. Only 44 countries um, have good laws on the books. Seat belts, same thing. You see that there's a theme here, that good legislation is hard to come by. And child restraints, um, only 53 um, countries around the world have uh, best practices. Um, and more importantly, for child restraints, um, enforcement is very poor for, these, uh, for, these, for this legislation. So we need to focus not only on the laws, but also enforcement of these laws. Um, even policies such as those that promote walking and cycling exist only in 35% of the countries. And when we're talking about building sustainable cities and sustainable transport, um, we need to really focus on these policies as well um, to create a safe environment for people. But the evidence tells us that not 
no one thing is effective in, in addressing um, road traffic injuries. The most successful programs are multi-sectoral, uh, multi-pronged. They combine legislation, regulation, enforcement, product modification, environmental modifications, um, education and skill development, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to hear um, from our partners, our uh, speakers today who've been working in several different organizations. So I'll end with this thought and our speakers will um, cover, will we'll take it from here. What do we, where do we go from here? We know the problem, we know solutions that work, but I think we need to move beyond just a shopping list of items. We need to have a strategic framework that looks at all the competing interests for road safety or for the transport system. You have mobility, you have um, social justice principles in place. You have safety. These are all competing interests and people need to come together to be able to talk about a uh, unified vision in terms of where we want to be as a transport system that has safety incorporated into it. Um, so how then do jurisdictions or organizations coordinate um, and integrate their actions across elements of the system. So how do these different stakeholders, these multi-sectoral um, collaborations happen? How do leaders promote this optimization is the, is the big question, is the, is the issue that mainly is um, at the backbone of this implementation challenge that we're talking about. Um, we do know that change is required in the way we do things. We are talking about a multi-sectoral problem and we do then need a focus on both multi-sectoral, so intersectoral versus intrasectoral. Even within the government, we have multiple different parts of the government focusing on different issues with competing interests. So there needs to be intra-sectoral intra as well as multi-sectoral engagement. Um, but more importantly, we need to think outside the box. Gail talked about the sustainable development goals, and while we have specifically road safety addressed in goals 3 and 11, it's not like we can't leverage work being done um, or investments being made in other goals. So for example, we look at goal one, where we have no poverty. We know that road traffic injuries lead to a huge economic burden for families as well. They can drive families to poverty. So why can't we tag on to that goal? Um, we know that they disproportionately affect males. So why can't we, or females are affected because they're left with dealing with the consequences of um, road traffic injuries. Why can't we tag on to that? We know that um, emergency medical systems are also needed for fields like maternal and child health. Why can't we collaborate with those fields to expand trauma care services or to expand post-crash services or emergency medical responses? So with that, I hope that um, We'll hear from our speakers um, about the work that they're doing in different sectors and how we can all come together to you know, address road safety in this new opportunity and framework that we have of the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you very much, uh, Abdul. Uh, you certainly set the scene for us so we understand the challenges and the opportunities. <coughs> and we uh, also saw how the progress has been making or not making over the uh, decade of action. We certainly seem to have stabilised with growing transportation in um, some of the um, jurisdictions. But we certainly need to uh, fast track or fast forward our efforts and collaborate cross sectoral to ensure that we have um, an impact. So we've got four different sectors here today and four different professions represented. I'm going to invite each of the speakers to make a short presentation and then I will invite you to um, uh, pose questions to each of the speakers or across the panel. So um, my f it brings me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Flavio Chunto. Um, professor Chunto is Associate Professor at the Federal University of um, Chiara State in Brazil. And he's the Scientific Director of the Brazilian National Association for Transportation Research and Education. He initially worked as a transport engineer and he was commissioned to coordinate the development of the municipal accident data system of Fortaleza City. 
As a professor and a researcher in road safety, his current main research interests are on st statistical safety, modelling applied to the production of crash frequency and the severity and traffic conflict studies using computer vision and microscopic si simulation. So welcome, Flavio. Um, can I please have some help with the uh, location of his presentation? Thank you, Gail. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I think that um, for us it's a gr great pleasure to be here to discuss a little bit about our work in Brazil. Uh, as Gail mentioned, I'm a transportation engineer. So I hopefully by the end of this presentation, I'll be able to give you a, a, a flavor of what we can do to help achieving the sustainable <coughs> development goals especially the 3.6 and the 11.2 uh, goals by the WHO. Um, let me give a brief, brief introduction about my city and my, my state and also my country. I come from a, from a northeastern region of Brazil. That's the CRI state up there. Uh, the name of the city we live is Fortaleza. Uh, we have uh, about 2.5 million inhabitants and our fleet is basically uh, one million vehicles in 2015. Uh, but um, of these, we have about 26% of it uh, formed by motorcycles. Uh, to us, it's an it's a, it's a extra challenge to deal with this because you know we have a lot of uh, different type of interactions among these type of vehicles. So we, we can, you can see on the right hand of this slide, the areas where we had uh, fatal crashes in Fortaleza in 2016. Talking a little bit about the, the university, uh, I, I do my research in Brazil, in Fortaleza. We were founded in 1955. We are currently have approximately 25,000 students um, spread into 73 courses. And our uh, Department of Transportation Engineering um, we have a grad studies that has been um, initiated, has been created in 2001, and we started our PhD uh, doctorate program in 20, 2011. So going more specifically to the uh, main areas that I have been doing some <coughs> research, I think that uh, we could divide it into two um, uh, main, main approaches. One is a more a classic, more, more um, currently used approach which uses, uh, which applies uh, historical crashes, uh, crash frequency records to, um, to make safety assessments. And the other that tries to be a little bit more inclusive in terms of trying to use not only crashes but also situations that uh, uh, where vehicles or vehicles and pedestrians were involved in um, events that w almost lead to crash. We call it uh, traffic conflicts. So I, I will show two, uh, two of the works we have been doing. One relating to using crashes as, uh, as the safety measure, and the other using traffic conflicts. Um, for, for us, it's, um, uh, in the transportation field, it's uh, very clear to us that we have good tools for urban and transportation planning in order to provide new environment, to investigate new alternatives, and to give an um, um, idea of how the traffic is going to be uh, spread. So we know we have good indicators regarding uh, traffic delays, average speed, um, queues. However, incorporating safety measures uh, in an ob objective way is not an easy task. So uh, what we are trying to do is trying to incorporate road safety in a quantitative way uh, into these three, let's say, transportation planning levels. The operational, more microscopic, 
and a tactic and a strategic level. So I, I, I will start with the uh, more microscopic, uh, disaggregated level. Um, I'm sorry for the uh, mathematical expressions. I don't, don't, don't focus on this. Just check the, the graph, please. Um, what we did, this is one of the studies, we picked uh, signalized intersections in Fortaleza. This is a very microscopic. It's just one type of entity, signalized intersections. And uh, we came up with the, with the relationship between the traffic flow and the number of lanes and the expected number of crashes. You see two curves. The, the, the curves in the, 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 the bottom part below is the, uh, the US curve. That, that shows us the expected number of crashes for, um, for US signalized intersections. So I, I picked just one, one of the points. Let's assume a 30,000 vehicles per day um, on uh, intersection in US. So we are expecting to have something around 5.8 to 6 crashes per year. So in Fortaleza, so our studies show that uh, for the same type of environment, of course, we just uh, focus in here on AADT and the flow and the number of lanes. We are expected to have 11. <coughs> so there are lots of differences between these two environments that, are, that is making this curve to shift up. Proportion of uh, drinking, uh, drinking and driving, uh, proportion of vehicles uh, above the speed limit. So there are some elements that that expression cannot show. <coughs> Uh, that, are, that is making the difference in terms of the crashes in our environment. So uh, the idea is to improve those, uh, those type of expressions to incorporate like human aspects of the, uh, of the road safety. So going to a more macroscopic or aggregated level, we can just treat uh, the whole network as separate elements like links and nodes and then we can have a, a broader picture of the safety for the, the whole city. This is a pilot uh, uh, application in Fortaleza. You see on the right hand just areas, uh, like similar as neighborhoods uh, uh, in, for, in Fortaleza. And uh, we tried two different situations. In the uh, upper part, the scenario one, we increase the demand. This is a planning scenario. Just uh, in the future, if we increase the demand by 10%, the number of trips, we're going to have an increase. Uh, you can see in brackets the percentage of the, the increasing the number of crashes. So we're going to increase in some neighborhoods, like 45 percent, 31 percent, and so on. Uh, we use those expressions of the previous slide to come up with those um, this new uh, estimates. And and in this scenario too, we just uh, included we we did some changes in the infrastructure available. We uh, inserted. We increase the capacity for a few links. You can see in the, the orange. Uh, those are links where we increase the number of lanes, for example. And we also change a couple of intersections. We change them from unsignalized to signalized. You see those uh, blue dots? I hope you can see it. So this change um, kind of uh, turned the, the whole crash environment for the city. You can see that we had some uh, in, on the left side of the Scenario two, we had some reduction in terms of crashes. It's like the, uh, the, the increased capacity kind of um, lead people to go to those new links with the higher capacity and migrating the crashes to those uh, new, new situations. So going to the, uh, the second part of uh, our, our approach, which is try, tries to be more inclusive using traffic conflicts. I'll try to give you a brief explanation. Uh, let's assume you have two, two vehicles uh, approaching an intersection, and then uh, the traffic light is turning from green to red. So we have to stop, right? So the, the, we are expected to have a reaction from the vehicle that is following the first vehicle. We're not talking about who's blaming who. This, we're just saying that, well, we have a stimulus vehicle, and then we have a response vehicle. They have to do something to avoid the crash. So um, if we think that um, 1.5 seconds is a, is a reasonable, reasonable number for a reaction time, we can say, wow, if I have a situation that where two vehicles or one vehicle is approaching to a, a, a pedestrian, 
and he has less than 1.5 to react, we are in danger. So that's how we define conflict. So the idea is, uh, I was supposed to show you a short movie here. Let me see if I can get it. So the idea is to either, either observe those situations in the field. For that, we can use uh, video processing. Or we, can, we, we do have the capability of simulate the whole environment and then try to look in detail for those details for those situations. So you see, uh, we represented uh, a signalized intersection in, in Fortaleza. So um, we have totally, total control of the uh, geometric attributes, traffic lights, uh, urban environment. However, the, the human as aspect of this simulation is still, uh, we're still working on it because it's obviously it's very complex. But with this type of approach, we can uh, test very different scenarios, very interesting scenarios uh, that we could um, change and, uh, and, and, and see what happens in terms of safety if we change something like, let's assume we, we insert 80% of uh, self-driving vehicles in the fleet. What will happen? Let me go back to the end. Uh, oh, sorry. So uh, um, to illustrate the, uh, one, one of these uh, applications using microscopic simulation, this is a, this is a recent study we, we just published. Um, we try to see in Fortaleza what happens when we have uh, ad adverse weather uh, on urban streets. So in, for one hand, we measure that we're going to lose our capability of braking by 25 to 30 percent because it's more it's slippery, right? Because it's, it's wet. Well, on the other hand, we, we are supposed to adjust our behavior because of this new weather um, characteristic. So we found that in, in Fortaleza, uh, average driver, they, uh, they drive a little less fast, so it's like about 4% in terms of the free flow speed. And, and, and average driver also maintain a, a larger, larger space when following the vehicles, between 3 to 8%. So we have, in one hand, we have this uh, disadvantage because of the, uh, the bad weather, but we adjust our behavior. So the, the, the big question is, well, so are we becoming safer or not? So we try to address that by using the simulation. So uh, this is to show you, we, we did this uh, the, the pilot study. So this is a corridor. You see uh, 14 uh, streets and then the main street. So this, uh, this graph shows how the traffic conflicts are distributed as we increase the traffic flow. So this is a very low traffic flow, medium demand, and high conditions. So we, 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 were, we, we were able, able to map mostly the traffic conflicts. And what happened when we mixed the, uh, the wet conditions and uh, aggressive driver and wet conditions with the cautious driver? Remember the 1.5, right? The, the, the reaction time. So if you have below than 1.5 here, you may be in danger. So you can see in this uh, graph that um, the gray line up there, which represents the rainy season, however, with a cautious driver. We, we gain a little bit in terms of reaction time. So the conflicts, the average, um, it got up from 1.20 something to 1.4. It's not that much, but we still have a little bit of extra time to react. Well, let's assume, let's assume all, we all are very quick in terms of response, and we are able to, re to res respond by, I don't know, one second. So we're really quick, and we're ready to, to break, right? However, uh, we don't know if we, ha if we have the skid resistant enough 
because of the rain. So uh, it, having a higher TTC doesn't mean that we are safer. Uh, in fact, if you see uh, on this graph, check the, 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 the columns, the medium or high, these numbers are showing the following. Uh, when, we, when we have a, a conflict below 1.5, for a rainy season with a cautious driver, which is the, uh, the gray column on the right, uh, we still have 25 situations where even if I have this reaction time, I won't be able to stop. Uh, whereas if it's uh, dry conditions, I have a little more severe conflict. However, I have the skid resistance good enough to stop the vehicle. In other hands, our adaptation uh, in other words, in our, our adaptation to this new type of weather was not enough to uh, make up for the, the skid resistant, resistance that we, we lost. Well, so I, I hope at the, uh, I'm, I'm approaching the end of the presentation, so I hope uh, we'll be able to contribute uh, to achieving the, the sustainable development goals by providing tools. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that we have uh, good tools to, um, to assess different alternatives to reach the safety development goals. Thank you, Thank you very just, much. If you would just say a few just before you get to sit down, I would like to ask you, Flavio, you've look, worked at three levels to reduce conflict severity and frequency of um, traffic crashes. Are you seeing a, a, um, a reduction in death and injury as a result of the changes you've made or severity of injury? What are you seeing there? Well, I can tell that uh, the, 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 the environment in my city in Fortaleza, it's becoming very, very positive in terms of uh, safety. We've been experiencing a reduction in uh, road deaths since 2014. So we, we had in 2014 around 200 and 320 deaths, which put us in on uh, about 12 deaths per 100,000 inhabitants. And in 2016, they just released a report, so we got down from 320 to 274. Um, I, I would like to say that uh, I have a part of this on this because of my students. We have a couple of students working for the municipality, and uh, it's, uh, I would like to to think that I, I'm part of this. And we know that speed is one of the biggest um, contributing factors to death and injury on the road. What has been the overall reduction in travel speeds uh, in your city, and what impact is that having? Uh, in Fortaleza, we, the mayor has been trying to, it's like Fortaleza is pretty much 60 everywhere. It doesn't matter if it's a local street or a arterial street. So I think that over the, the last two years, we have been trying to reveal this. So now we are trying to, uh, to, to, to choose different speeds for different type of road use. And uh, we are experiencing re a very good reduction in some of the streets. Population is, is kind of uh, not into it, really, but we are getting there. So okay. we have good reductions in, in some of the streets in Fortaleza. So little by little, you'll yeah. reduce it down to at least 50 and maybe 30 where there are pedestrians. That's good. Thank you, um, Flavio. You're not free, by the way. We will be asking for questions from the floor after we've heard from okay. all speakers. But thank, thank you, you very much. much. A very interesting. I would now like to invite our second speaker, who is uh, Dr. I'll just. Yeah, I'll ask Who is Dr. Viet Cong from uh, Vietnam, from yeah, Ho Chi Minh City? Actually, oh, Hanoi, <coughs> Hanoi. <coughs> Hanoi. <coughs> I, I see him in Ho Chi Minh City, so uh, he's a traveler as well. Uh, Kong is the director of the, for the Center for Injury Policy yeah, so and Prevention Research. He's a member, uh, a key member of the injury research team at Hanga, Hanoi School of Public Health since 1997, and with 
uh, other key researchers who provides leadership and technical guidance for a number of injury research prevention activities, including the National Injury Survey in 2001, Child Injury Surveys for UNICEF projects in 2003 and 2008. He's the coordinator and principal investigator of Downing Child Injury Prevention Project. And recently, he's the principal investigator of the Vietnam National Injury Survey. If you want to know anything about injury prevention in uh, Vietnam, Quang is certainly your man. So I welcome you. Thank you. Okay, good morning everybody and thank you Gil, very much for the uh, very nice introduction. I am very uh, uh, happy to be here and uh, to share with, uh, with you some of the uh, our work in, uh, in Vietnam. So at the, uh, I came from the Hanoi School of Public Health and I work in, the, in public health in, uh, in Vietnam for 20 years already. And, uh, but my major work is focused on injury prevention. So I work with not only on road traffic, but we also work on, on drowning and other type of injury in Vietnam. So uh, the, today I, I would like to, to say with you what we are doing at the academic uh, the institution and how we support government and different uh, agency in uh, and working on the case of helmet law in Vietnam. This is one of the solutions that uh, uh, try to reduce the, uh, the road traffic related deaths. And I think that it's very important to contribute to the sustainable development goal number three in Vietnam uh, and also in other country in over the world. So, we are going to uh, celebrate the compulsory helmet law. It's going next week uh, because in December 2007, we have the compulsory uh, helmet law in Vietnam. And, and this month, it's the 10 year on the past. So uh, I, I want to go around the, the, the history and the process of how to develop and how the academy to support the government to, to, to implement the, the policy in, in the helmet law in Vietnam. So we came from a low and middle income country in Southeast Asia with about more than 20, uh, 90 million uh, population. And uh, in our country, uh, road traffic injury related deaths that contribute to the largest burden of disease uh, among the 15 and, and 49 uh, in Vietnam. And it's, it's the second leading cause of dying among uh, male in the country. And uh, about every year up, Promise uh, about about 10,000 uh, deaths. That is the according to the National uh, Statistics Office. It's 10,000 deaths, but WHO is the report is 20,000. So a different, very different between the the National Statistics and and WHO estimation. And we'll have about half a million uh, road traffic victim admitted to the hospital. And I, and I know that. Many of them will have the permanent disability from that uh, amount of people. And we have the problems, uh, and we also uh, see the rapid motorization in Vietnam. And uh, I think that this figure is so you from 1990 up to uh, 2015. And the, uh, uh, the green one is the number of motorcycles in Vietnam. And in, from 1990, we have mostly about like a 1 million motorcycle in Vietnam, but in 2015, uh, we have about 44 million, about half a population in Vietnam, uh, equal to half a population in Vietnam. It's about 44.1 million motorcycle, and it's about 95% of vehicle in Vietnam. Car is few, but uh, they get more and more now, but uh, a motorcycle is the majority of transportation in the country. And we also see that we have the, uh, the, some, the, the blue one is the, the number of injury deaths. Uh, uh, the, and also the rest one is the number of injury, road traffic injury in Vietnam. So it's go uh, up and down and go up again. Uh, it 
uh, doesn't mean that we have something to control, but government changed the definition of injury. So it go drop up immediately, and they go up, and, and in 2010, they go up again because it's, they changed the definition of, of injury. So it go uh, quite uh, strange like that, but it's not uh, the intervention. So in the last 10 years, we also see the number of road traffic injury that is uh, up and down, especially in 2007 when we, we see that the number of uh, motorcycle, uh, road traffic injury deaths it go up until the, uh, about almost 20,000 people die in that year. And in 2007, the compulsory helmet law in Vietnam is become effective. Uh, and we, from 2007 until 2013 and, and 2017, we see that the road traffic injury debt is go down a little bit, but we didn't see any significant reduction uh, the, up to, to now. And in the hospital data, we also see that uh, uh, there are many causes of road traffic injury, and including car and pedestrian, but majority of the uh, road traffic related injury is the uh, contribute to motorcycle uh, in the country. So we have the, in Vietnam, the, uh, the helmet legislation in Vietnam, we already have since 1995, but uh, they stated in the helmet law, and also we have in 1997, the, the uh, dedicated agency for road traffic injury is set up in 1997. Uh, and, uh, but we work at that time before 2007. Uh, the, the rate of wearing helmet uh, with motorcycle is very low because they like a compulsory and also the problem that we don't have the proper helmets for the people in the tropical country. When we have, if we have the full face helmets or that the people not the complain that it not be able to wear because it's too hot. And uh, there are so many different things that they try to avoid not wearing helmets. But I think that uh, because of the problem of road traffic deaths and government have the strong commitment and the, the year 2007, we, uh, uh, we put the mandatory uh, helm compulsory helmet law for the people. And I think that it's very uh, achievable. And in this picture, you can see that in December 15, 2007, what we always call that remarkable day for road traffic injury prevention in Vietnam. That is the day we, we, we uh, go out and the government that is in 15 December 2007, every motorcycle have to wear the helmet, otherwise you will have the big fire and we have the strong uh, 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 solution for uh, consequent for the motor, uh, rider. And you can see that with the picture took it just a week ago, just December, 11, if you see in the, uh, in the picture, I think it's very few people, or you didn't find anyone in the picture wearing the helmet. But December 15, 95% of them wearing helmet on the street. And I think that everyone's surprised and, and why, what has happened and, and how we can do it. And I think it's not only in Vietnam, but internationally, they have a lot of uh, attraction from media and from the people from, from public health and uh, why the government of Vietnam can do it. Uh, very uh, successful uh, campaign in, in 2007. And now in 2017, after 10 years, that is some figure, it not really evaluation research, yes, but we have some report from the NTSC and, and some other uh, institution, and we will uh, have the very good reports by the end of this month. But we see that after 10 years, 90% of motor riders now wearing helmets. We see 12% drop in traffic-related death, 24% drop in traffic-related injury, and we estimate that we save about 20,000 lives and about 400,000 inches because of the very good implementation of the compulsory helmet law. So what is made possible? And at the institution, research and uh, institution, we, we always uh, the, try to, to find out what is the, the, at the role of academia, what we can we contribute for the, the successful of the helmet uh, uh, implementation in <laughs> Vietnam. First of all, we, we think that the process of uh, implementing we based on the very good data, very good evidence. 
because before that, it's very difficult to, to, to see the good practice on evidence-based policy in low and middle income country. And we always complain, the government is always complain that we don't have enough evidence and we need more survey. But I think that there are some data, even it's not good. But I think that we have to use, we have to communicate with policy maker. So we, we work with uh, uh, different agency, we collect the many evidence from the issue, uh, from the helmet, from academia, from the hospital, from different sources of, of the data, and we try to advocate for the government to implementing the, uh, the, the helmet law in Vietnam. And we also approach the parliament and the, the top leader of the country for the, the commitment to implement the helmet law. We, I remember that we, we bring the data from hospital and go to the, the, the uh, prime minister office and present the result and, and convene for the, the approval of the uh, helmet law implementation in Vietnam. So we have the high gate political uh, commitment. We also use the data to communicate an effective uh, solution for the for the population using different channel media and, and newspaper and we also work with different uh, uh, sector like a police to have enforcement without enforcement I think that uh, we will not be able to implement this and we also uh, one of the very important issue that is the availability of appropriate helmets we have the helmet law in the year 2000, but seven years before 2007, I think the proportion of wearing helmet is very low because people that I don't want to wear the right cooker or don't want to wear the very hot, in the hot weather, I don't want to wear the, the full face helmets. So we work with the, uh, uh, the company, the producer, how to import the model and develop the standard helmets to, and to make the availability of appropriate create uh, helmet for the population. So some of key points that made possible for, for the helmet law in Vietnam. And then we got a lot of attention. So we implement the big research. For example, in 2001, we do the first national uh, injury survey, including the road traffic, but not just focus for road traffic injury, but for other injury as well. And 2007, we also have the, another national injury survey to look at the, uh, the, how we do it in Vietnam. And we also implement several uh, small scale survey, for example, the observe the helmet use, the head injury, burden injury, and we do a lot of the, uh, evaluation for intervention. We uh, organize and we use our uh, research data to communicate uh, uh, scientific evidence and effective solution to the policy maker. And I think that uh, uh, we love publication in the international journal, but I think that for implementing something in the country, I think uh, uh, policy brief, just a small presentation is very effective. The policy leader don't read the full paper, especially uh, in the country uh, like a low and middle income country. They said that too scientific is not good for the uh, making decision, so they don't like that. But I think that uh, discussion, meeting with them, and gives them a, 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 a piece of information, but uh, uh, appropriate, I think it's very good. So we work with different ministry, we use different channel. For example, we use the uh, WHO and UNICEF. At that time, we don't have GISP, yes, but uh, UNICEF and WHO is very strong uh, uh, partner with the injury prevention in Vietnam. So we use it, uh, the outside void to, to approach the government and to, to bring the, uh, the uh, uh, evidence to the policy maker. It's also very important that we need to communicate the scientific data and the evidence to the population by the using social media, involving the different uh, the NGO and the different organization to communicate the message of dangerous if you're not wearing helmets, effective of the solution wearing helmet can save life, and we use a different channel to, to communicate the message to the population. And then when we, we, we implement uh, the law, we need to show that is that law is appropriate and is that law it, it good and effective, and we do a lot of the, the uh, evaluation, even that we don't have big budgets to do a big survey, but I think that we do different channels to get the data. And we also look at the quality of helmets as well. 
because the, uh, in Vietnam, when we uh, first implemented uh, the helmet law, we have the very few companies that produce a good helmet. So they import a lot of helmet, the fake helmet, unstandard helmet from other countries to Vietnam. So that also makes us very uh, big uh, uh, difficulty in, in uh, running the program. For example, we also uh, use our evaluation uh, the, to sell to the government and also to propose a new policy. For example, when we have to, we found the problem that after three years, uh, when we run the program, we didn't see any reduction in brain injury proportion in hospital. So we need why, why, what, what it happened? If the if the proportion wearing helmets is over eighty percent. Because according to the review from uh, Rebecca Ivers, so that it could be effective. Why is not effective at all? We didn't see any reduction. So we did think we see the problem of incorrect helmets. You, we see the problem of non-standard helmets, and also we see the problem of Chai helmets. You, because the, uh, in Vietnam the law is like the something that they not require the children under six to wear the helmets. They not uh, enforce for people wear the helmet, but they not put the strap on, or if they, if they use a non-standard helmet, it look like the helmet, but it not have any protection uh, effective in that case. So we, we uh, also fail and we found that problem and we produce uh, the evidence and we go to the government and the different policy maker to propose a new solution. So if you see the, 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 uh, the history of helmet law in Vietnam, we, we change and we update the law every year almost every year from 2000 to, uh, 2007 up to 2016, we update the law, we add some new uh, issue, we add some solution in the law every year. Uh, and it's recently, we are working with the National uh, Traffic Safety Committee and uh, government to look at the e-bike user. Because e-bike just introduced in Vietnam a couple of years ago, and uh, it's not the motorcycle. So it not uh, become under the law, uh, uh, motorcycle law. So young children under 18 and they, they're not wearing helmet and they go uh, with the e-bike and the e-bike speed is it, it not uh, low. They, they can speed like a 50 or 70 km per hour. It's very quick one, very powerful e-bike. Uh, Issue. So uh, we're still working with them. If we found any problem, we uh, work on the data and we go to government and discuss uh, with the uh, different policy maker. Yes, it's not easy at all, and we face a lot of challenge. It's difficult, especially we have the, uh, the different working uh, objective. The government. Uh, have something different from the academic point of view. For example, we face struggling when uh, the government sells the data, it reduction 10% uh, number of uh, road traffic injury debt, reduce, uh, reduce 10% per year in the last five years. It's, it's impossible to do that. Everyone knows that it's impossible, but the government, some government, they want to have some uh, uh, good uh, uh, evidence that they work very effective, so they sell the, some data. We don't, don't say that is fake data, but I don't know where it comes from. They reduce every, every year about 10% of injury debt uh, in Vietnam in last five years. And uh, so I think that they have different perspective, but they also hear from us, even that they want to have some pride from government, but they still uh, want to hear from us, and they still believe that our, our data is also good. And also we have the, uh, the policy contact is uh, changing over time. If we have new leader, we have uh, not good uh, the connection with the policy leader and that the owner of our work could be changed. Uh, and we also, some of Bridget Apples is not ready to policy making process because we want to have a full report, we have the good data, we have the odd ratio, or we have the regression model, but they don't like that thing. And uh, we, they need us to, to produce something is simple. But I think that the owner of us are in the academy it's a institution, and, and uh, sometimes it, it takes a, uh, a little bit time to produce something that uh, uh, policy leader can, can use. 
but I think that uh, uh, in Vietnam we also have very good uh, opportunities that we can share the evidence with <coughs> policy makers. We involve the policy maker at the, at the beginning and for every single uh, our study we always involve them at the beginning. We introduce study involving them that we're going to have some news and we ask them that if they have uh, something they want to, st to get more information or want to evaluate some data or some policy that we can, uh, can help them. And we also uh, sharing knowledge on uh, what work and, and how we can do better. Uh, uh, with the uh, limited result. Yeah, that is some of the uh, our work in, in Vietnam. And uh, thank you very much. So, I'll the, just ask you a question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Kong. I must say that the world was applauding the work that happened in, uh, in Vietnam in 2007. To see that remarkable change from very few helmets to almost, uh, you know, 100, almost 100%. But one of the things I have to ask you about is uh, imagine that you were the world advisor on helmet policies. We've seen many, many um, countries without good policies on helmet wearing and we're seeing uh, poor helmet wearing in other countries. Vietnam introduced a policy that was not complete. And as you said, it, there have been many, many, many changes mm. over time. Uh, the question has two points. If you had your time over again, would you make your policy absolutely complete with the strapping, the quality, and the wearing um, for everybody uh, at the same time? So a comprehensive policy, or do you think it's uh, best as you've done it to introduce the policy and then strengthen it as you go along? What would you recommend countries to do? get a good policy or to build a policy over time? I think that, uh, yeah, if we can build a very good policy and comprehensive policy at the beginning, it's really good. But actually, uh, uh, we also don't know it, what is a comprehensive policy and how it's running if we not start yet. So sometime, and especially in, in uh, in the case of uh, we need to do something quick or the solution should provide as soon as possible for the pollution. I think that we could learn from other country and we can uh, uh, implement the uh, policy uh, uh, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And also in uh, the same as the, the our problem in Vietnam now with the alcohol harmful reduction law, we expect to have very comprehensive law on alcohol reduction. We learn from other countries. We learn a very uh, best uh, practice from different countries and try to put in the law. But I, I mentioned with you th the other day that it's been seven years we not be able to pass the law. Yeah. So I think that comprehensive uh, policy is good, but uh, uh, sometimes it, it takes a lot of time. And if we have more solutions, they have more discussion between different parties. So I think it could go ahead and, in my opinion, my own opinion, it could go ahead and do it. It also seems to um, some of us that uh, the p uh, penalties that are applied to non-helmet wearing or non-compliant helmets is relatively low. How do you get the buy-in from your population so that they um, are not, they're doing it voluntarily rather than uh, as a result of a possible penalty. How did you get the compliance? I think that one of the uh, 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 solutions that we do in, in very early days of the helmet law, that we need to provide the appropriate uh, helmets and with very, very late cheap price for the population. And if for some, at the beginning, for, for in 2007, I think that we also have several campaigns to distribute the free helmet law to the population and encourage them to use. Defy is cheap, but I think that uh, when they see uh, other people wearing helmets and they ask themselves that why I'm not wearing helmets, so they, they automatically they, they can, uh, can go and buy one. And I think that uh, cheaper helmet but uh, meets the standards and encourage the population 
to use and use the social media. I think that's some solution that uh, we, we already. Thank, thank you very much. Please uh, thank Dr. Kong. I must say that there are many, many countries that have looked enviously at the, uh, pop, uh, at the helmet wearing rates and how they've increased. We'll uh, open the floor for questions for Dr. Kung soon. My next speaker is uh, Dr. Francis Africa from Ghana. Um, he's Chief Research Scientist at the Building and Road Research Institute in Ghana. Um, Francis, um, sorry, it's really hard to see up here, isn't it? Uh, is a Chief Engineer by, prof um, a Civil Engineer by profession and a Chief Research Scientist working at the Building and Road Research Institute in Ghana. Um, Francis has 30 years experience in scientific research and an interest in road safety. <laughs> so welcome to you, Francis. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'll be looking at Ghana's effort in trying to meet the uh, sustainable development goals. And uh, by way of uh, introduction, this will be the outline. And then Ghana is located in West Africa. Uh, capital city is Accra, and we have 10 administrative regions. And about 60,000 kilometers of roads, uh, basically 2 million registered vehicles, and on an average, there are about 2,000 uh, road traffic fatalities annually. By way of uh, introduction, uh, already it's been mentioned that we have about 1.25 million deaths on the road globally, uh, 30 to 50 million injuries, of which 90% of all fatalities occur in low and middle income countries. And it's already been pointed out that the risk of death is highest in the African region uh, uh, compared to Europe. Ours is about 26.6 deaths per 100,000 population, but Europe is about 9.3. It's already also been mentioned, uh, these pillars, and we are working with them effectively, making sure that we'll be able to uh, reduce road traffic deaths by 50 by the year 2020. By way of a road safety management in Ghana, we have a lead agency uh, known as the National Road Safety Commission, which coordinates uh, road safety activities in Ghana. The National Road Safety Commission collaborates with other key stakeholders uh, to manage and, uh, road safety in Ghana, uh, know, knowing that uh, you have to bring everybody on board uh, over uh, the period, they have developed national road safety strategies one, two, and three. The third one uh, is in line with the UN uh, uh, decade of action. What we have done, like I mentioned, we have various agencies working together to uh, reduce fatalities and injuries in Ghana. We have put systems in place. We have a standard crash reporting form such so that whenever there is a crash, we, we, we know what sort of information that should go on the form. And uh, we also have technical facilities to manage a crash database, which is being hosted by my institute uh, using microcomputer acid analysis developed by uh, UK, TRL UK. And we still stick to international standards 
where fatal crash is based on the 30 days reckoning of the of a victim involved in the crash. And we make sure that the, the core elements of crash data is based on the interaction between the user, vehicle, then the road environment, making sure that all these things are captured to be able to gain better understanding of what is happening. So basically, we have standard crash reporting form for data collection. Uh, we have computer facilities for data storage and retrieval. We have trained personnel in data analysis and dissemination. These are some key things which we, we gather, uh, we make sure we gather when we are collecting data. Things, general information, road user, users involved, uh, their age, sex, etc. the road environment, and then the vehicles involved. My institute is deeply involved in uh, traffic management in Ghana, and uh, we are responsible for the nationwide crash data collection from the police, uh, for which we can uh, uh, code them, uh, key them into the uh, uh, map system, and uh, work on them for uh, first for research purposes and also to write report which will guide the National Road Safety Commission as to what should be done at any given time. Because uh, if it is not evidence-based, then you find it difficult tackling the uh, problems. We have what we call the road uh, safety cycle. We make sure that uh, whatever is done is driven by safety research, uh, which will determine the sort of interventions uh, uh, to be carried out. And then once interventions are done, we do monitor evaluation, which will lead to safety policy. And then the cycle continues. So like I said, systems approach is used, and then injury risk factors are looked at, and it should be evidence-based. Uh, we also look at passive and active interventions. Uh, in our case, the issue of seat belts, the issue of speed harms, reducing speeds on uh, uh, on our roads, particularly in settlement areas where there are a number of pedestrian knockdowns because of the high speeds of vehicles. We collaborate strongly with research institutions. Uh, as we know, road safety is a shared responsibility. And so the lead agency has forged partnerships with uh, research institutions and academia to carry our scientific research in road safety. Here, uh, the scientific research is needed to be able to understand and tackle the critical risk factors which account for the frequent uh, road crashes and injuries. Not only that, we make sure that road safety research uh, research-based policies. We have uh, safety research-based uh, policies, you know, to drive whatever we do. There is this simple question, road safety research must be contextualized. Are problems in high-income countries same as in low- and middle-income countries? Already uh, the first speaker indicated that no. There are differences. So we should be informed by such differences. And if you look at it, US is guided by their real problem is with drivers of cars. You know, whereas Malaysia is already be pointed out, you know, Vietnam and other places, they have the motor riders. But in Ghana, our situation is basically pedestrians and uh, passengers. So one should firstly identify the key problem to be able to apply uh, the needed you know, interventions. You cannot only uh, look up to the advanced countries because everybody is saying seatbelt, then we say seatbelt, and it may not 
because if Vietnam had said seat belt, it wouldn't work because he said they have even a fewer number of cars. But they have identified their problem to be motorcycle riders. So that is uh, how the whole thing had been tackled. So the Ghanaian context. In Ghana, if you look at the various we have I've already mentioned, we have 10 administrative uh, regions in Ghana. And here we see that Greater Accra uh, uh, is leading, uh, followed by Shanti, and then it comes up uh, down that way. And about 41% of all fatalities could be attributed to pedestrians. Uh, but in recent years, we are having problem with motorcycles. You know, in recent years, some 10 years ago, it was non-existent. But now, uh, we have what we call Okada, uh, where uh, motorcycles is, is used for passenger transport and uh, is, is posing a big challenge. It has overtaken uh, fatalities coming from car occupants, uh, from uh, bus occupants, and it's, it's on head of. You know, so it is one area that in recent years uh, we are tackling. If you look at the uh, statistics that we have, until the UN uh, decade of action, it was just rising. But if you look at the last five years, it is, it is now dropping, which, which is good news. It's, for us, it's good news. Uh, it shows that we've started doing things right, and uh, we would like to continue in that direction. From a basic analysis, we've realized that our problem is uh, uh, with uh, the rural road situations more than the urban situation. <laughs> and so whereas the uh, UN, uh, uh, let me say the sustainable goals is emphasizing urban, you know, for us, yes, we are not uh, going to lose sight of that, but we, we are putting a lot of effort into trying to uh, solve problems in the uh, rural uh, road situations more than urban. It doesn't mean we are not uh, looking at urban at all, but that is where the problem is. And uh, uh, ever since we started installing speed hams in villages, you know, that's why we are seeing that it's dropping for the rural areas. You know, because now when you get the speeds <clears throat> have to come down. You cannot maintain the same speed, you know. We did, um, we've put in place a lot of speed uh, uh, management measures. And we did that by first uh, going out there to uh, do measurements, to see what is happening in some of the uh, uh, settlements along the major highways. This one um, <clears throat> is on the Accra, Kumasi. Accra is the capital city, and Kumasi is the second uh, largest city. And we found out that uh, more than 90% of the vehicles exceeded the posted speed limit. You know, and <clears throat> so uh, we put in place rumble strafes and speed hands to be able to you know, reduce you know, speed in settlement areas. So these are some of the measures we have put in place, making sure that you cannot maintain the uh, <clears throat> high speeds. Some of them were making 120 kilometers per hour, others, and now when we did evaluation, we found this is the result. Run now, most of them are being far less than 50 kilometers per hour. You know, uh, that, that is the more reason why we are seeing improvement. You know. So um, <clears throat> one has to really understand the system, what is happening by measuring uh, the, the situations uh, there, and then you do evaluation to see what is happening? In conclusion, I would say that road safety situation in Africa, Ghana as a case, requires 
real attention. It is through systematic data collection and research that the local safety problem can be diagnosed for application of effective safety measures. Collaboration with research institutions and universities is needed in order for them to bring their expertise in applied research to bear on road safety uh, policies. Thank you very much. Congratulations on uh, reducing travel speeds uh, because that's a key uh, issue for many countries um, in, in the involvement of deaths and injuries. However, in 2015, um, we saw that 41% of deaths were pedestrians. Can you um, perhaps uh, share with us a little way how you're addressing the issue of pedestrians and how you're prioritising the safety of um, the many people who are walking? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> we've queried our database and we found out that, like is indicated, pedestrian is key. And apart from the urban centers, majority of them are coming from settlements along the highways. Normally one there, one here, when you put them together, it's a lot. That's the more reason why we have calmed traffic in those environments. But for the urban regions, uh, there is a lot of, you know, walkways, you know, uh, as part of the road development, uh, traffic coming where we have schools and those type of things. These are things that mm -hmm. we have put in place. And uh, just a second question from me. You have a national road safety committee that is a multi-sectoral and cross-sectoral um, group. Uh, you also have a target of reducing deaths and uh, deaths by 50% uh, by 2020. Uh, it seems to me you're making some progress, but there's a long way to go. Yes, yes. So let me ask you, um, how has the NRSC changed their priorities or increased their sense of urgency to meet this target? We, we see that it's, it's a real challenge. I would say before the UN decade, we were trying, but it wasn't coming down. But now uh, it seems to us that we've started hitting on the right chord. So it's dropping. But it's not dropping to our satisfaction. But we will still, particularly we find out from the data that um, motorcycle from nowhere. Some 10 years ago, it wasn't contributing even 10%, but now it's, it's contributing a lot. So it is an area that we have focused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just am I hearing you correctly in saying you're having to switch your attention to address the motorcyclist? Does that mean that some of the attention has gone off no, pedestrians? No, no. We, okay. we are keeping our hand on pedestrians okay. and at the same time looking at this one. Good work. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much. And uh, I invite you to think through a question um, for the speaker. Our final speaker today is Dr. Krishna Rao, who's a professor of civil engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology in um, Mumbai, or Mumbai, uh, in India. He has over 30 years of teaching, research, and consultancy experience in the area of transportation systems engineering. He completed his PhD in urban transportation planning in 1996 and a master's in transport engineering in 1986, both from the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras, India. His research interests include sustainable urban transportation planning, travel demand modelling, urban land use modelling, transit oriented development, traffic design analysis and safety, and pavement analysis. So he's a man with a lot of interests and skills, and we look forward to hearing from Dr. Rao. So thank you.
thank you very much. Uh, it's great pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. So I am, uh, uh, of course, we started with uh, South America, then we moved to Southeast Asia, then to West Africa, and now to South Asia, of course, India. So I'm going to just give you some data, some perspective of related to road safety in India. Of course, the picture is not same as everyone has presented. Everyone is struggling to reduce the road fatalities, road injuries. The same story here. Of course, uh, as I was introduced uh, to work, I mean, I work in the area of urban transportation planning. That is sustainable urban transportation planning. And uh, one of the goals that we work very closely with that 11 sustainable cities and communities. And one of the very important aim there is to introduce safety and especially to reduce the road fatalities, improve the road safety. Of course, we have heard from the previous speakers, though there is an ambitious target of reducing the fatalities by 50%, but in fact, we are actually increasing, which is very, very disturbing. Now let me present some of the data from India. The road traffic deaths, the report of 2016 is just out by Ministry of uh, MORTH, Ministry of Road Transport and Highways in India. So it is around 150,000 fatalities in India. But what I actually believe is we always look at this number in terms of so many fatalities per thousand people, 100,000 people, sorry. That is around 12, and maybe through the model available, they may say it is 16, but whatever is the number, but I strongly believe that this particular statistic is not a very good, uh, the correct statistic, which may not give actually the true uh, situation. So I believe that we are actually ignoring the number of vehicle kilometers that we travel on the road network. Now this statistic we are using maybe because it is very easy, the data is readily available. And with reference to this statistic, this is where we stand and this data is actually given by again the Transport Ministry of India. So this can be disputed of course. Of course the road safety, global road safety report puts it through their modeling as 16 instead of 11. So another uh, point, which I, why I am saying that the statistic of the number of fatalities for 100,000 people is not a very good representative statistic. So look at this slide, again taken from the global status report. The high income group, countries, uh, the vehicle, owner, vehicle ownership is very, very high. And if you represent in terms of the average trip rate per person uh, will be at least three to four times when compared to even middle income or low income countries. And then in order to reinforce that, nowadays the journalists are very active. In fact, last 15 days I have seen every day a report on road safety in our uh, number one newspaper that is Times of India, so which is actually very good. And there is an interesting article relating to the number of fatalities in our Indian defense forces, which includes Army, Air Force, and Navy. And it puts the number of Army personnel killed in road accidents as 350. And it is much more than the army personnel killed in all the wars that we have fought since independent. If you convert per year, it is several <coughs> times more. Now here there is one point to be understood. The soldiers, if you find out, their uh, average trip length per day, or number of trips that they make on motorized vehicles per day, is actually much, much higher than the oh. national average of any individual 
making trips. So for example, for in Mumbai city, the number of motorized trips per person is only 0.7. But whereas it may be four times here. But if you use the denominator as vehicle kilometers, then that actually becomes a better indicator. Now we also have seen from all the presentations that the most vulnerable road user is the two-wheeler. And in India is also the same story. So I have combined here two-wheelers as well as three-wheelers. Three-wheelers, motorized three-wheelers, we call them as auto rickshaws. They are very, very popular. They actually provide last mile connectivity. So we need to have that mode. But we need to also address this problem of road safety. And uh, another problem, you may look at cyclists. In India, what has happened was when the cities are progressing, slow, gradually, the today the situation is such that the parents are very much afraid of sending their wards, <coughs> their bicycle onto these streets because the streets are not designed to actually have these bicycles. And similarly, the parents are, they prevent uh, their children wards to go onto the roads, uh, walking on the roads. These two things are very much prevented by the parents. But I'm very surprised why they allow their wards to take the two-wheeler once they, of course, have attained the age of getting the legal license and they encourage them, they buy very good bikes and then they are on the road. But in fact, most of the streets are not even designed for these two-wheelers. So when there are so many two-wheelers around, why we don't have any exclusive lane for them, protected lane for them? Now, people also sometimes think that these accidents do happen during early morning because of sleep deprivation, but actually the national statistics show completely a different picture. Most of the accidents, they actually happen in the evening time from 3 p.m. to up to 9 p.m. And this is actually reinforced by another statistic. Again, I have collected this from, again, News uh, Times of India. So it also, it is actually a real statistic because we can believe this statistic because these are actually the calls received in hospitals through this uh, number 108. So this 108 has been very recently introduced which is again the recommendation of United Nations that we should have a common calling number for taking care of these emergencies. So this is that call data. Even this call data also reinforces that from four o'clock to uh, eight o'clock, the number of road accidents are huge. Of course, the experts, some of the experts attribute this to uh, drink driving as well as fatigue because this is end of the day, they are returning and the traffic density is high, but nobody has actually done any kind of research on this. This is only the data that is presented. Now, I also would like to summarize some of the salient statistics from 2016 report. Uh, it is good that in my country, the transport ministry now has uh, started issuing this report every year without fail. If you see, 61% of the fatal accidents have actually happened in rural areas. Now, this also tells a very clear uh, fact that India is actually now developing and we are building huge amounts, thousands of kilometers of highways. In fact, uh, we have an ambitious plan of building close to 80,000 kilometers of road length maybe in the next 10 years. So this. Uh, we have already built and we are accelerating and one of the statistic people are interested to know about is how many kilometers is built every day. So this also comes in newspapers and the government is very proud about it. So, but this statistic, 61%, so the accidents are happening in rural areas. Mainly they are happening on these highways, on highways in open areas. So not in urban areas, 61% are happening in rural areas. So it may be because of we have built huge amount of highway length and there are some issues to be addressed on these highways. So the deaths on highways are very, very significant and they're very high. 
and of course maximum number of road accidents are also happening on two lane roads uh, we still have substantial length of two lane highways which are not divided and we also have substantial length of single lane roads and another statistic is 37% of road accidents they occur at junctions and within junctions almost 73% are at uncontrolled intersections so professor vedagiri is here my colleague in fact he also is a contributor for this presentation he works uh, on road safety and he has actually done quite a good amount of research on uncontrolled intersections uh, in fact he has devised an index through which one can identify the conflict severity of a uncontrolled intersection and thereby one can also plan what are the various preventive measures in order to reduce the accident or improve the safety of such uncontrolled intersections uh, <clears throat> now i just uh, highlight some of the articles in the last 15 20 days that are reported in our newspapers nowadays uh, this has become a routine thing so you, if you open a paper obviously there is at least one article on road safety linking with some accident that has happened so this uh, sleep deprived bus drivers they are putting passengers at risk this is also a problem because uh, Uh, significant number of people this travel by buses long distances and one of the problems is the operators nowadays we allow the private operators to run the buses and these operators they don't actually put two drivers when actually they are required in this particular article they reported that this particular bus is coming from nagpur to hyderabad which is about uh, maybe 800 kilometers or so but it takes about 12 hours or 15 hours to reach hyderabad but there is only one driver and in fact several accidents such accidents have happened when such accidents happen a huge number of fatalities actually happen and there is a lot of uh, um, directives from the supreme court nowadays uh, as per supreme court directive nowadays it is compulsory to have trauma centers in each district now there is also some good news the articles report i don't know because whether these are happening because of some proactive measures so it says that there is steep decline when compared with 2016 between january to september the same periods in 16 and 17 there is a steep decline in road accidents and uh, again the roads are deadliest in the evening hours from 4 pm to 8 pm now coming to the vehicle ownership now this is where uh, our role becomes very important we need to make our cities very sustainable so when i was going to school those days the buses were available they were available at very good frequency we used to board the bus and get down at the school or even wherever we want to go for most of the activities we used to use buses but now what has happened with economic development these buses could not cope up with the increased aspirations of people they need comfort convenience all that and then this uh, then slowly we also allowed this uh, private uh, private vehicles to come up and because of that what has happened is sorry the private vehicle ownership has increased like anything but whereas the supply on public transport has actually remained at the same level which was 20 30 years back and this is how the vehicle ownership is increasing this is not for the whole country this is only for mumbai city this also includes two wheelers two wheelers constitute 60% of this 40% are cars you can see how steeply the vehicle ownership is increasing now actually mumbai is a very good example of public transport share even today if you consider only motorized trips 75% of all those trips are made by public transport but the issue is we have a crumbling suburban rail system it carries 7.5 million passengers per day 
and now we need to provide more supply, augment public transportation. So that's why the city government, the Maharashtra state, is implementing a more than 200 kilometer length of metro rail system. In another 10 years, this will be up and running and it will cater to another 9.5 million passengers. So the existing railway is catering 7.5 million. We are going to provide another system which is going to cater 9.5. So unless we do that, we can't arrest. You cannot simply say don't buy cars. You have to provide alternatives. And that is where even it will have an indirect effect on road safety. You can also see the reduction in the number of uh, road fatalities. There's another news item, minor sibling sneaks out on bike. And so they entered onto a main arterial street where people actually drive at speeds of 100 kilometers per hour. So this problem is also there. So implementation, enforcement is an issue. We have all the laws. We have amended our Motor Vehicle Act several times. 2017, the recent amendment is in 2017 during monsoon session of this parliament. And there, the fines are increased like anything for violation of not wearing helmet, not wearing seat belt, speed. So the traffic fines have now increased like anything, but it is now the matter of implementation. When I look at the news reports, they also report that the tire two cities, now they started implementing because Motor Vehicle Act, the rule is already there. You are not supposed to drive two-wheeler without, without helmet. But now the Mofasil towns report that from so-and-so month, we are now enforcing the use of helmet. Okay, so this is how the problem is actually the enforcement. And now when we actually talk to traffic police, what is that they actually enforce? Now they have actually uh, these 10 violations, which they give a lot of priority, and they always only look for these kind of violations which also include our four risk factors which we are talking about, speeding, not wearing helmet, then restraints, and so on and so forth. So here you can also see long hours of driving, use of mobile phone while driving, and uh, wrong parking of vehicles on highways and roads. Now here I would like to also point out when we are implementing such mammoth road infrastructure, so what happens is, earlier in front of my village there is only a two-lane road or a very small road passing. But the accessibility of these villagers in attending to their activities sometimes gets curtailed. This has actually been noticed by the transport ministry and now in the revised designs they always look at whether the accessibility of the people living in the nearby these uh, I mean, multi-lane highways is addressed or not. So this is an important issue. And even in Motor Vehicle Act now, they have introduced a clause that even the designer will be punished if it is found that the design fault is the cause of an accident. <coughs> so based on all this, um, of course, uh, these are very much uh, conform to whatever action points that our national government is embarked on, conforms to the, as a member nation of United Nations, whatever uh, is prescribed. So there is a lot of uh, campaigns uh, that we are always now seeing that uh, these uh, media is reporting in a very big way. Now road safety information gathering and maintaining, there is a lot of improvement. So this report itself, every year there is a report that is released and there is a standard format in which that report is being released which covers all the salient aspects and road safety research promotion, safer road infrastructure. Uh, this is given a lot of importance and we are actually seeing in phase one implementation of highway compared to the current phase implementation of highway. So in phase one implementation, as I told you, the accessibility to the residence by the side of that multi-lane highway was curtailed, but now it is being addressed in that phase one roads as well as in the new roads, there is a proper design now. Uh, the safer vehicles and safer drivers, so the vehicle technology, technology uh, is being promoted 
in order to uh, make the vehicle safer as well as uh, the drivers are driving them safely and best practices for vulnerable road users. Now this NMT and two-wheeler, so this is at to be, is still the debate is on in our country because the two-wheeler ownership is huge. But in that case, why we are not actually allocating a separate road space for them? So the de debate is on and then the uh, bicycle lanes. Earlier, once upon a time, when I was a child, I used to see bicycle lanes in some of the cities. But those bicycle lanes now has taken over, merged into the carriageway. And then emergency medical help. Now we are seeing this uh, standardized calling number throughout the country that has been implemented. <coughs> These are some of the actions of government of India for improving road safety. So these are, uh, nowadays, even the Supreme Court, there are some uh, public interest litigations filed in the courts, and all of them actually have been taken to Supreme Court. And Supreme Court has given point-wise implementation requirement to government of India. And this slide is actually from those adoption and implementation of national road safety policy in a comprehensive manner by every state government. There is. Then there is a road safety council to be formed by every state government, which actually reviews the actions implemented by the state government and what are the results. And also each district collector is now empowered <coughs> and his responsibility is to collect the data on road safety and every monthly they have to report, give a report and see how things are actually happening, whether there is any improvement or not. And earlier, there is, we have only traffic police. In traffic police, the highest uh, level officer is the director uh, general of police. Now they have created another position in the traffic uh, police department, the DIG exclusively created for road safety. And this fellow's job is only to monitor road safety. So like that, there are several proactive measures that are on and which we are visible nowadays and uh, let us hope that things will improve further. But once again, I reiterate that we may be hiding under that statistic of so many deaths per 100,000 people. And if you convert that in terms of so many deaths per 100,000 vehicle kilometers, it will be a different story. OK. So with that, I think I'll conclude my talk. Thank you. Dr. Rao, thank you very much. And congratulations on having your best year yet for road crash data with uh, road crash reductions uh, in 2007. I think that's where oh, you okay. started. Um, I, w I want to say that you have an enormous amount of data and you um, seem to know where the problems are and what the problems are. Um, and you also know where the solutions are. Uh, and what could be done. And we saw a lot of action points uh, and uh, we saw some government um, actions that are possible. I'm wondering if you could share with us, what's the time lag between um, you collecting the data and publishing the data and actions actually being implemented? And how can you make that more rapid to ensure that you get a, a, a greater reduction in death and injury on the roads. Okay. Uh, in fact, whatever data that I have presented, it is actually the data given by the Ministry of <coughs> Road Transport and Highway, or Transport Ministry. Okay. More. Yeah. So, in fact, uh, they are actually publishing these reports, and uh, as I have actually presented, that there is a, a road safety council in each state government. And uh, there is also an authority in each district, district collector. So they are actually monitoring this data. Uh, there are two things here. Of course, uh, the collection of data, how exhaustive is that data? So that's why the stats, most of the statistics are related to the fatalities. Because the injuries, minor injuries, the data may not be correct. Okay, so. Uh, it's not me who is monitoring this, yes. but there is actually a system out there set up by government of India, uh, which, is, which has started working. And there is also an intervention by Supreme Court. 
So this monitoring is actually happening at government level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Uh, if you take your place now, and uh, I'll invite the uh, group to um, uh, propose any questions to any one of the people, particularly in relation to their um, uh, their presentation and how it relates to the um, sustainable development goals. Fedric. We have mics on both sides for questions. Could people come? Okay. Fedric, could you take? with the government and secondly how to convey the results of a research uh, in the sense that that we university uh, uh, does not teach the government so the government doesn't feel that they are being taught by us something like that thank you Uh, I, I have to, to. Will we answer that question first, or? Oh, yes, perhaps. Uh, Andres. Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, one is for Dr. Kuntu. Um, Fortaleza has a, a really outstanding major, and uh, you mentioned the reduction in debts uh, recently. Anecdot anecdotically, and and uh, how. To what extent do you think that the political will of this major, uh, who's a public health practitioner, uh, uh, led to this to this reduction on debts? And secondly, to to all the panelists, um, how uh, in relation to the SDG, uh, how do you think that the community should convey the fact that uh, road safety is an equity issue? How do you see that we can we, we can take that? to the governments and to the funders. Dr. Rao, would you like to take the first question? Oh, okay. On how um, you can influence government and how you can make them not feel like they're being, this is my um, interpretation of it, how, how we can feel and not make them feel pressured uh, by um, groups. Okay. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I cannot give uh, uh, advice on this, but uh, I will just uh, tell you what exactly we do in India. Uh, as far as uh, the transport ministry is concerned, nowadays they are very proactive. They themselves send out requests for proposals to the universities and institutes. They themselves identify that this particular institute is capable of doing this kind of research and find out some solutions to the problem. So that is what is happening actually. Mm. Otherwise, for example, Professor Vedagiri is a well-known road safety auditor actually, identified as a road safety auditor in India. So these uh, researchers themselves, they actually take up voluntarily they make a proposal, submit to, again, the Ministry of Transport or the Department of Science and Technology. And this is one of the very important areas identified now. So if a proposal comes, obviously the chances of funding is very, very bright. And once uh, the research has been done, once you do through sponsored mode, it has to be disseminated at the end of the project, you have to conduct a workshop involving the government agencies. So that's how it happens there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm not sure about this kind of mode is available. Okay. Fitri, you can ask a second question <coughs> if you wish, uh, if you uh, want um, a more complete answer, or you can speak offline to Dr. Rao. But let me just ask um, uh, Flavio about the mayor in um, Fortaleza and how important it is that he has uh, the political will and the priority of road safety and also um, 
how uh, can we make road safety an equity issue in the minds of the people and the mayor? Well, um, I think that we we have been lucky so far over the, the last five years, I would say. This is uh, well, in Fortaleza, the mayor, the, uh, the term is at four years and then he can be reelected for another term. So he's been there since 2011, uh, 12, 2012. So it's his second term. Uh, the, 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 the current mayor, he's a medical doctor, as you know, he has a PhD on public health. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, I've, been, I've been there working in road safety since 2000. And he really, he really bought the idea of road safety. Um, I, I remember in 20, uh, 2012, when he started, he came to the university to talk about forming a group to study road safety. In the group, we had psychologists, but mostly uh, transportation engineers as well, uh, statisticians. So he formed this group and start working in road safety. So I, I, I can tell you a lot of stories um, that uh, it, 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 they, these stories were very uh, interesting because he had some friction, political friction, to, to deal with in Fortaleza. When he started building uh, cycle paths, uh, cycle lanes, bicycle lanes, um, improving uh, pedestrian crossing, uh, uh, he reduced speed in some, some areas. There was uh, uh, there was some friction because the, the, the overall population wanted to be the same. I have I have friends that when when we start this uh, bicycle movement and installing new bike lanes, they were like, Flavio, I don't know what's going on. So we're <laughs> having these bike lanes everywhere in the city. So wow, he said the, the, the space. This is spaces for cars, and he really bought the idea. And uh, after two to three years, uh, the population got used to it. And uh, the reduction we have been experiencing, uh, it has to do with it. it um, also, the, the pedestrian crossing, we, we, we have some, in Fortaleza, like new installed pedestrian crossings, like zebra crossing on, in the X crossing, which is very interesting as well, raised pedestrian crossing. So, uh, he really got into it. He, he bought the idea, and and uh, to the point that now it's uh, it's uh, it's hard to turn back. Mm. So the population got used to it, and, and the population is um, enjoying it. The, the reduction in terms of uh, deaths. Of course. And the second point, the equity. Um, yeah. I think that this is the only way for us to reduce. Uh, fatalities if we if we put this as a social problem um, and what I'm trying to say is that um, we have to give power to those that are more vulnerable so if you go to most of the Brazilian cities we will see that um, if you're a car owner you have the power to to do whatever you want well if you're a pedestrian, it's just because you don't have money to buy a car. Mm -hmm. And this is changing. We can see the shift. Uh, it's like I have now I have lots of friends trying to go to work uh, using a, a bike, not just to go uh, uh, at the beach, but really trying to go to work using the bike. And uh, also lots of friends trying to walk it's, uh, we have this security problem also on our streets, but they're trying to overcome this as well. So mm -hmm. we, uh, we can see the, the shift uh, into this, uh, this problem, which is uh, very interesting and very good for road safety. Okay, this Andres. I can't see him now. Um, okay, another question, please. Uh, both of you can come down. Okay. I have one question for the president of Ghana mm. that show that the road injuries are more likely to occur in rural areas mm -hmm. and deaths also are occurring there. 
So most publications I found show just to road injuries are occurring in urban area. What is typical in Ghana, where you found those results? And even the, I want to link this with the last uh, presenter that showed those urban rural injuries. Probably, uh, can you just tell us if those are pedestrian that was hit? or just something, uh, some idea, to have some ideas on what's really going on in Ghana mm -hmm. about those road, road injuries in uh, rural cities. Mm -hmm. And probably, maybe, you, uh, one idea I had when you say that was the definition of the rural and urban. We know that several new cities are coming out in Africa, and probably the law should change about the definition of rural and urban. Maybe that is also one idea I had when you say that. It, is it clear or not? Yeah. Yes. Um, Francis, I'll just take the second question before you answer. Thank you. My question is to Dr. Kuhn. Um, thanks for the excellent presentation you did concerning helmet use. My question is, um, usually when it comes to pedestrian motorcycle and people habits, changing habits, um, you can have evidence, you can show that it's good to wear helmets but it's difficult for people to change their habits. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what did it take for you to let people change their habits that the helmet wearing rates increased from about 10% to, to 90%? And the second question is to Dr. Rao. Um, you mentioned that now there are penalties for people who develop roads that are not friendly when it comes <laughs> to um, traffic regulations. The issue is, should that happen or it should start right from the design of the roads when you have to check that before the road is um, passed for it to be constructed, if you have those traffic safety regulations in there, why should you wait for it to be constructed before you find the one constructing the road? Thank you. Okay, let's hear a response from Ghana. Uh, thank you very much. Um, First, definition between urban and rural. Urban is uh, any settlement with more than 5,000 uh, people. Uh, it is rural if it is lower. And like it is, if we had not collected the data, uh, the indications would be that uh, everything is urban. But from the, the data, you realize uh, things change. From most literature, they will indicate urban, urban. Yes, but in Ghana, the situation is completely different. It's, it's all because we have a number of uh, highways running through small settlements. And the interesting thing is that um, you have uh, the school on one side of the road. Uh, you also have where people fetch water being on the other side of the road, and they are compelled to cross. And in the, in the process, some of them are hit you know, by vehicles. So these are some of the things, not, not until you put systems in place, you might not really understand what is happening. So in our case, urban is a settlement with population more than 5,000, and uh, rural if it is uh, lower. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Kuhn, could you explain what it takes um, to change people's behavior? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, first of all, I will say that uh, it's not easy for us at the uh, beginning couple of years for when implementing the the helmet law, uh, but I think that first uh, uh, thing that we think that is very important is the enforcement of the government. So very strong enforcement for the first uh, couple of months mm -hmm. after we implement the the helmet law, and before we implement in in December 2007, I remember that we have six month advertisement on TV, on all the media, and we announced the uh, inform the population that the December 15 is the, is the day that you have to wear. Mm. And I think a six month advertisement before and strong enforcement after the, the uh, we implemented the program. And uh, 
We also run a lot of social media and we work with different uh, agencies. For example, we have the program that uh, uh, every single government officer must to wear the helmet when they go to the office. So they have some uh, people to control the process and, and force them to wear. And for example, students, when they go to the school, they have to wear the helmets. And I think that for, for, for the first year, it's a very strong program for different agencies, especially where the government control uh, agency that we, we do very important. And I think that, uh, uh, so I think that it's automatic chain when the, uh, lots of people wearing helmet and if you're not wearing helmet, it will feel something that is not good. Mm-hmm. So they chain immediately. And, but before that, if just only few people wearing helmet, they'll think that everything is normal, not wearing helmet. But when 80% of the population wearing helmet, if you're not wearing helmet, you wouldn't feel sorry for you. So it changed, I think that, uh, but uh, it takes uh, <coughs> one or two years, about two years. I think that changed quite far. Thank you. Dr. Rao, could you please address the question uh, relating to uh, compliance of road Mm. users versus Mm. road construction or road um, development? Yeah, actually, what I mentioned was the comparison between that the previous phase and the present phase. It's not that uh, as per in the previous phase, the roads are not uh, wrongly designed. So it's about uh, when you are making a single lane or two lane highway into a multi lane highway, then you are actually cutting off the access, easy access of the people living by the side. So at several junctions, so they have provided only at grade junctions, but now the whole system has been uh, changed. So there is an independent engineer, there is also an independent road auditor. So this road safety audit goes along with the conception stage to the implementation, construction, operation stage. So this is all now happening. Whatever is constructed in phase one also is now going through the road safety audit. Whatever improvements are needed, those are also being implemented and many places they are all implemented. So it is sometimes what happens, you have the design codes which has not actually addressing a real problem which has been encountered at that point of time. So those have now been taken into account and people are even doing research on those and uh, the design codes, guidelines have been now changed. So at that point of time, it was not actually a violation. But now if somebody does like that, it is a violation. (laughs) Thank you very much. The time is now uh, run out for us. We need to um, finish our discussion and I I did want to ask my own question but I don't want you to answer and that is how visible are the sustainable development goals and particularly the two that we highlighted earlier in your peak bodies that are managing road safety in your countries? Don't answer. Um, (laughs) But I want you to think about it and if not to go back to them and to Uh, talk about it. I would like you all to share your uh, appreciation for our speakers and uh, thank them very much. I'd like to now invite Dr Connie Ho to the podium please. Thank you so much, Gail. So I'm very delighted on behalf of the Johns Hopkins International Injury Research Unit to first thank our panelists for their very interesting and insightful presentations that all highlight how road safety is key to achieving the SDGs. So Dr. Flavio Kunto talked about using modeling for transportation planning, bringing an engineering perspective, which is really refreshing for us at the School of Public Health. Um, Dr. Kun Pham talked about um, uh, helmet policy change in Vietnam, which is a great success. And he highlighted the role of academics in communicating with politicians as well as with the public and how important that is. Um, Dr. Francis Afukar talked about the Ghanaian case, provided context, and emphasized that road safety is a shared responsibility. 
and that there is this need to collaborate with research institutions. And then Dr. Krishna Rao talked about the road safety situation in India, emphasizing the need for more enforcement and the need to look at implementation. I also really liked how you brought um, media data um, to your presentation. So for me, there's two things that cut across all these presentations. So first is the need for scientific evidence and hence the important role that we as research institutions play in road safety. The second thing is this notion that Dr. Abdul Bachani brought up in the beginning, intersectoral collaboration, intrasectoral collaboration. So we're very fortunate um, to be in a very multidisciplinary, or to be working on a multidisciplinary topic such as road safety, right? There's a lot of stakeholders involved. But this also poses a challenge for us. So moving forward, how do we forge effective collaborations in order to address road safety well, either in your countries or globally? I also want to, on behalf of the unit, thank uh, Ms. Gale DiPietro for moderating this uh, symposium. She also reminded us that the S SDG should really motivate us to do something about road safety. And of course, I want to thank the audience. Thank you all for participating, those of you uh, on site and online. It's great to see some students from our class, too. That's great. And finally, of course, I want to thank Bloomberg Philanthropies for making all of this possible. So I hope you enjoy today's symposium. I hope to see you all in the future. Um, and uh, we have lunch um, in front of the Wall of Wonder. That's always very important. And um, thank you very much.